Hi everyone and welcome to this video. So in this video I'm going to be talking about Redis which is basically an in-memory key value store. Redis can be used as a database, a cache, a message broker and very many other things. So without further ado, let us get started by installing Redis. So right here in my Windows subsystem for Linux, I'm going to go ahead and set up Redis. The configuration is going to be so smooth. So the way I'm going to be doing that is by saying sudo apt install redis server. So feel free to install in whatever way you want, but I'm going to be using Windows subsystem for Linux and Ubuntu to make this simpler. So this is actually going to be picking the redis server from our repositories and installing it to our Windows subsystem for Linux. Now that our Redis server has been installed, let us go ahead and confirm whether it has been installed. So to do that, I'll just go ahead and type Redis and then server. And now it has started a Redis server right here. So I'm going to reduce this a little bit. So we now see that our Redis server is running, which is good. So to access the client, we have to basically run the Redis CLI command. So I'll go ahead and open up our Terminal, I'll open up a new tab. So I'm using Windows Terminal and Windows Subsystem for Linux at the same time. So I'll go ahead and run Redis CLI. And this will go ahead and establish a connection to our server at port 6379. So let us go ahead and confirm whether our Redis server has been installed. Now to do that, I'll just run ping and then this will return pong meaning that our connection has been established successfully. So now that we've installed Redis, let us understand what Redis is. Redis is the short form for the remote dictionary server. And what this does is to store our data using keys and values at the basic level. However, Redis is not just a key value store. It can be used as a database and the difference between it and other databases is that it stores data using data structures that it defines. So we shall be looking at some of those data structures in this video. So the first thing we're going to do is to go ahead and understand how Redis works at the low level. Redis is a server, meaning we have to make requests to it via a client. So the connection between a server and a client occurs through the TCP protocol. I won't talk about that in this video, but I hope you'll be able to understand that and make research about it. So once you establish a successful connection between a client and the server, now in this case, our client is the Redis CLI. Let me actually increase this so that you can be able to see it. And when establish this connection via TCP to our server, we can be able to write various commands to our server and be able to create, read, update and delete data in our server. So we can also use programming languages to be able to do the same thing. So the beauty is Redis has provided a bunch of libraries and the community that can help us to write these libraries and tools that can allow us to act as clients or help us to write our external code on Redis to do the various things that we want to do. Now, in this video, I'm going to begin by the basic hello world that we do in every new technology. I'll begin by using the set command and I'll say set and in this case, we shall set a message. So the message is basically a key and then you're going to provide a value. So in this case, I'll say our value is going to be hello world. And when you have this, I'm going to set enter and this is going to set the message, which is the key and then the value, which is hello world. Now, when you go ahead and try to get that specific message, we have to use the key. So if you're to see this command right here, what it's doing is to just keep a value or keep some data and this data we can be able to access using our key, which is our message key. So when you go ahead and access this data, we are going to use the get command. So you can 
use lowercase uppercase doesn't really matter so i'm going to go ahead and use get and in this case we have some nice auto completion that's telling us that we need to use a key so in this case when you provide the key so let's say the key we set is going to be a message this is going to return our value of hello world now another thing we can do is to set multiple keys and values so how we do that is by using that m get and m set command so the way you can think about this is when you have many keys and values that you want to store you have to provide all of them and set them so that you can be able to access them via the same command of m get so let us try this so when i go ahead and say m set now i'm going to be using african capital cities and their respective countries now i'm going to be using countries as keys and then values something like country and then the capital city so this is actually going to be the capital city so what you're going to do is to get a country and then specify the capital city of that country as the value so let us go ahead and do that so i'm just going to come and what i'll do is to set so i'm going to begin by setting the capital city of my country which is uganda and I'll set the value to the capital city of Uganda, which is Kampala. And then we are also going to go ahead and set the capital city of Kenya. So let's say Kenya, it's going to be Kenya. And here we shall set uh, the capital city of Kenya, which is Nairobi. And then we are also going to set another key. So let us set the capital city of Rwanda. So I'm just going to come and say Rwanda and this is going to actually have a value of chigali and when we do this when i press enter we now see that all of these keys have the data that has been set so let us try to access all this so when you use mget we are going to provide a list or many keys that we want to actually access values for so in this case we shall have to provide our countries so when you say uganda and then let's say we try to access Kenya and also we try to access our Rwanda. And we can also get our message in this case. So I'm also going to provide it. In this case, we see that we've been able to get all our all our values for the case we've specified. Now in this video, we're going to look at Redis as a data structure store. And I'll be showing you the most basic data structure that is stored by Redis. This data structure is the building block of all the other data structures. And it's what helps us to basically build our data structures that we can store in Redis. So I'm going to be talking about strings and how we can use them in Redis. So let us begin with a simple example. I'm going to begin with a simple set command. So I'll just set and then I set a name. So my name is going to be Jonathan. So I can also set my age. So age is a number, but this will also be stored as a string. I'll also go ahead and set a certain JSON object. I'll call it user and I'll go ahead and construct this. So it's going to be a string. And what I have to do is to escape the quote. So I'm going to make this a string of a JSON, some JSON data. So let's say we have a name and this name is going to be Jonathan. And then we can go ahead and provide our age. So we can say age and our age in this case is going to be, let's say 23. Now I'm going to close these brackets and I'm going to begin by trying to first escape this. And once I do that, all of these are stored as basically strings. So let us go ahead and confirm that. When we try to get our name, we can get Jonathan. When we try to get our age, we can also still get Jonathan. And when we try to get our user, in this case, we shall also get the value of the JSON data that we stored as our user. Now let us go ahead and confirm the types of these following values for which we have set keys. For example, when you say, uh, in this case, we can actually use the type command, which is basically a simple command provided by Redis to find out which value or to find out the type or the data type of a certain value. Now to do that, I'll just come and say type 
and then I'll provide our key. In this case, our key is going to be name, so that will return our string. We can also find out the type of a certain number, but remember, we are storing the numbers as strings, therefore it will return string. And, if when we, and even when we try to provide our name or our user, in this case, it's going to return our string. So this means that every data that we store in Redis is stored as a string value. So let us try to also explore some other things. So we can be able to find out the length of a certain value. So for example, if we wanted to find out the length of a name, uh, we're going to say str name. And since we set our name as a uh, key of name, we shall access it with name and that will return the length of that specific value of the name, which is Jonathan. Now, if you want to actually also do the same thing for our age, this is a string to actually also return the length of that string, which is true. And if we wanted to find out the same thing for our JSON data that we actually set, we can do that by saying user, and that will also return the number of characters within our JSON string. So I hope this is pretty straightforward. So there are also other things that we can do for certain data types that are kept as string. For example, if we store a string or a number as a string, we can be able to do some operations of it, which may be impossible on other strings like we're going to see. So in this case, we have our age. Let's actually just access our age, which is set to 23. This can be increased. It can be reduced. Something like upvoting and downvoting. This is actually the perfect example to do that. So let me set another number. So to do that, I'll just come and say set, and then I'll set a certain, uh, a certain uh, demo key for demonstration. And I'll say we are going to have zero votes for a certain zero votes for a certain for a certain post that we post. Now let's imagine we have a post and this post should have users upvoting and downvoting. So the way we do that is by coming and setting our votes. So when you try to get our votes, in this case we shall get our value as zero. However, if we want to increment our votes, we do that by upvoting. So Redis provides for us the command of incrementing. And by incrementing, we can say increments. And then we just specify the key. Now, in this case, shall just come and say votes. So that will increase the votes by one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then five. And that is just so simple compared to how you may want to do it in maybe uh, an SQL database and something like that. Now we can also go ahead and increase. So if we get our votes, in this case we have five votes, but if we want to decrease, we can actually say decrease, then you say votes, and that will reduce our votes by one, making it four. Now in case we also want to do, let's say, increasing by a certain amount, we can do something like increase by and then we specify the key. In this case, it's going to be votes. Then we specify, let's say we want to add 100 votes and that will make our total votes be equal to 104. But still, this is actually a string. If you try to get the type of our votes, in this case, it will be a string, but it's a number we can increment and decrease in a certain way. So you can also do the opposite by saying decrease by and then say votes. And then we specify that we want to reduce it by 100, meaning our votes will go back to four. This is amazing. Now, another important thing we can do with strings is to set the expiry of a certain string value. For example, sometimes you may want to set a value in our Redis store or our Redis database, but you want this value to go ahead and expire. Now, the way we do this is by coming and using set. Now, let us try to set a certain value or by specifying a key. So let's say we're going to specify the current, let's say current price of something for a specific certain time uh, is going to be, let's say 2000. And then we can go ahead and set the expiry by providing EX and then specifying the seconds. So we're going to do that and provide 20 seconds. So when you do that, our current price, so when you say get current price, 
it's going to be 2000 but still this is going to expire after a certain time and they will find out the time for which it's remaining to expire is by using the ttl command so specify the key which is going to be current price and this has already expired so when you try to get this we're going to say get current price this is going to be nil so this is just a straightforward way in which you can be able to set a value but let it expire after a certain amount of seconds however we can also go ahead and simplify this entire command by using our set x so when you do set x it's actually going to be set x and in this case what we're going to do is to go ahead and say set x then let's say current so say it's going to be our current price so you can specify the seconds and let's say in this case we want to give it more seconds so i'll specify 40 seconds and then we provide the value so let's say 2000 every time we shall say ttl of our current price this will be equal to 33 so if we do it again goes on and reduces until it go ahead and expire now if you want to do this and basically maybe do it with microsecond milliseconds the way you do that is by saying p set x and then it will take in the same key and then the same amount but in milliseconds and that will go ahead and expire that just like we've seen i hope you've been able to enjoy this video and one other command i'm actually going to specify is the one for deleting a key now in case we set a string value but we do not want to have it in our redis in memory store there you can be able to do that so let's say i get the name which is going to be jonathan but i want to remove this name and if i want to remove this name i'll use the del command and then specify the key now here we can provide a key or a list of keys so if i want to maybe del the name and the edge in this case it will go ahead and basically return the amount of values that it has gone ahead and deleted from our in-memory database so if you try to get i'm actually going to use mget which is the one that can help us to get very many values so in this case it's going to be name and edge and that will also return nil showing how we have been able to go ahead and delete this from our database at least provides for us a way in which you can be able to store a sequence of ordered items and in most cases these are strings so we're going to look at how we can be able to create a list and we're going to explore some of the commands that come when using a list we we'll also look at how these lists are very similar to how we may see the lists that we use in our normal programming languages so let us get started by creating a list right here in my terminal i already have my ready cli running so i'm going to begin by creating a simple list so we're going to begin by creating a list and then pushing an item to the end of that list so the way we do that is by using the r push command and we specify the list key so the list key is basically a way in which we name our list so i'm going to provide this i'm going to call this names and i'll call this names one so it's going to be our first list of names and then i'll go ahead and provide whatever value that we want to have as our first item in the list now keep in mind that all the values in our list can be accessed by indices and this is very similar to how you may see lists operate in arrays or lists in python and so on so we're going to insert our first name as jonathan and then press enter so what this is going to return is an integer value that specifies the length of the list that we want that we have created so if we want to check for the length of the list we've created we do that by using list len and that is the ln command so we specify the list key which is names one which is the name that we've given to this list and it will return an integer value of one basically showing us that we've been able to create a list and this list has an item that is one so let us go ahead and add another item so what we've done here is to create a list and the r push command basically checks if this list does not exist and if it doesn't exist it will go ahead and create a list with a list key of names one and then is that a value to the right of that specific list now let us go ahead and basically create one at the left or be able to append an item 
to that list so the way we're going to do that is by using the l push command so i'm just going to come and say l push and i'm going to provide our key which is names one and then we shall provide the value so this value is going to be jerry and this will be added as a first item to our list so when you press enter we now see that our list has two items and in this case when we check for the length we can see that our length of the list is going to be two now what if we wanted to access these various elements in our list now this list is very similar to how we may see an array or a list in other programming languages in case we want to access an item we'll have to access it from zero by using what is called an index so an index is a place that is a number that basically describes the place where that specific item is within our list so let's say we wanted to get an item of index one we can do that by using l index and then we specify the key in this case it's going to be names one and then we want to go ahead and specify the index so let's say index zero so this is going to return our item which is jerry so the name jerry is at our index zero now in case we wanted to find the next item or the second item that is going to be at index one so we shall do the same thing and then provide our index which is going to be index one so this will return the name jonathan now what if we wanted to actually go ahead and return all the values that are within our list so this provide for us a way in which you can be able to retrieve all these values so the way i'm going to do that is by using the l range command and then specify names one so here we have to specify which index we are starting at and which index we are stopping at so in this case we are starting at zero which is the first one and then we are ending at one which is basically the second one so this will go ahead and basically return our list and all the items in our list now let's say we wanted to add some more items to our list we may do that by let's say i'm going to just come and say uh we're going to use a right push to add to the end of the list so i'll just come and say our push and then specify our key which is names one and then i'll provide our values so let's say we're going to add jane we're going to add uh, sam we're going to add joel we're going to add patricia we are also going to add Ruth and I'll go ahead and press now when you basically enter this we see that our list has increased in values and now it has a length of seven so if we wanted to find out the length of this now when you do L range names and then you start from zero to one of course it's going to return the first two items now let's say I wanted to find out the all the items in the list that means you have to go from the first index to the last index of our list so i'm going to do this by coming and saying zero to let's say index of seven and this will return all the names within our list now let us go ahead and try to access or slice this list now in case we wanted to find out from starting from the last item to a certain item within our list that's when we can use negative indices so for example if we wanted to find out from uh the last name to the name at index of five then this would have a, an index of negative one negative two and negative three so let us try it out so if i say l range and in this case i say names and then one so in this case we can do something like starting from negative one to going all the way to negative three and this guy this is returning an empty set i think we are starting from negative three let us try and then we're ending at negative one so this is actually going to work so we did it the opposite way we are starting from negative three which is joel static that's when you're starting from the last and you go all the way to the last one which is ruth which is at negative one so if we try to access let's say from uh zero to negative so let's say from zero to let's say i wanted to access the name jonathan by starting from the negative side so it would be negative one negative two negative three negative four negative five and negative six so if you say it from zero to negative six that will actually go ahead and try to get from from items starting from zero on only going and up to jonathan so that will basically return 
only Jerry and Jonathan. So this is very interesting and it's very similar to how you may do it in Python by using slices and stuff like that. Now what if we wanted to remove an item within our list? So the way we would be able to do that is by using the lrem command and this basically takes in the key so we'll do something like names one and then we provide the number of items we want to remove so in this case we want to remove one item so we have to also specify the value that we want to remove so let's say we want to remove the name jerry so since this has removed an item it will return the integer value specifying the item that we've removed so in this case it's going to be the item uh, of jerry and it's one item so if we try to get all the so let's say I wanted to get all the names so in this case we shall say names one and then we start from zero going to seven so it's out of range so right now we actually see that it's returning all items within our list but all these values uh, do not have the name jerry because we have basically deleted it so this is very similar to how it may do it in a list we are basically deleting and we are specifying that we are getting uh, that specific we are we're specifying that we're actually getting this and we are deleting one item basing on the value that you want to actually delete another thing we may do is to basically pop just like we do it in the python list so by doing that we can do a left pop and a right pop so the way you do a left pop is by saying l pop and then you provide keys so that will basically get rid of the last item at the end of the list actually get rid of the first item rather at the start of the list and then return that item so if you say l top and then names one so that will basically return the name jonathan and in case we do an l range on our names one and then we specify zero to let's say three in this case you see that our name that was the first which was jonathan has now gone so if we say we are going up to the last item we don't see our name here so basically jane is now the first but it was jonathan that was the first name so if we want to do a right pop it's similar so if we do something like right pop we shall provide the key which is names one and this will basically get rid of the name root so if we try to access all the names we see that it's basically returning our list but in this case it doesn't have the last item what we had as the last item now this is amazing so in case we wanted to do something like let's say moving one item from one list to another we may do something called the right pop uh, l push so something like right pop l push and this will basically take in the source which is the source or the list we are actually trying to get an item from and then the destination so that is another list so this will also go ahead and create the list in case it doesn't exist so if we want to do that we'll do the source which is going to be names one and then the destination let's say we're going to create another list called names two and that will go ahead and transfer the name patricia from our list to the newly created list so if we try to get all items within our list we now see that we only have three items but if we try to get all items within our within let's say our list that we've created that will be using we can do something like l index and then specify names two and then index zero so that we return our name patricia meaning we've been able to basically move that specific name from our first list to a second list so today we're going to be looking at the hash data structure that redis provides the hash is a data structure that is very interesting in a way that it helps us to store records these records are collections of string fields and string values so each time we have a record that record maps onto collections of different strings which are the keys in this case but refer to them as fields and then values now a simple example can be us having a record of a person that person may have different attributes such as the name the age and the nationality now these are what we refer to as fields and then the values that we provide for those fields are what we actually call the values as we're going to see so let us begin by creating a very simple example of a person now i'm going to go right here 
already have my ready server started so i'm going to open up the ready cli and within the ready cli i'm going to create a simple hash so i'm going to do that by using the hset command that is the one we use for setting a hash now we begin by specifying a key and the key in this case is the exact record of the data that we are storing. Now in this case, we are storing data about a person. Now we need to specify the fields or the actual attributes that we may want to store for that specific record of data. Now let us begin by providing the name. So this name is going to be the name of that specific person we are saving information about. So let's actually call this person one. So it's going to have a name and let's say the name is going to be Jonathan. Now you can also go ahead and specify the age of this person. So the age will be 23. And then we can also go ahead and write maybe the nationality of this person. So I'm going to provide the nationality and the nationality is going to be Ugandan. So this is going to be how we are going to set up our hash. Now this hash is a collection of all these fields and these fields are also mapping onto the values of their fields. So in case we want to access the different keys or the different fields that this hash has, the way we do that is by using the H keys command. So the H keys is supposed to return all fields or all attributes that we are storing that data for. So for example, if we wanted to access all the fields that our hash for person one has, we'll have to use the H keys command and by providing H keys, we have to provide the person that we want to access the keys for. And this will go ahead and return the different fields. So for example, in this case, we shall have our name, we shall also have our age, and we shall also have our nationality, just like we set them up here. Now, in case we want to access the values for which we set these different fields, we use the H values, and this takes in the key, which is the person one or the record of the data that we saved and this will return the different data about that person so in this case we have jonathan which is the name we have the age which is 23 we also have the nationality which is ugandan now this is very important and helps us basically see how this is similar to how we may see a python dictionary or a hash in any programming language. So let us go ahead and try some other things. Now in case we want to get a certain attribute, we may use the H get command and this basically takes in the key or the record of the data that we are storing. So for example, person one, and then the field. Let us want, let's say we want to get the age of person one, then we'll have to provide the age and that will return our age of three. Same thing will happen for our name so for example if we want to access the name we can say person one and then access the field which is our name and this will go ahead and return our name now in case we want to actually access our nationality we'll do the same thing so in this case we'll do person one and this will go ahead and basically provide the field which is nationality and once we provide our nationality we can be able to get the specific nationality in this case which is a Ugandan. So let us go ahead and also see how we can be able to check if a certain field exists. Now there may be instances in which you may want to check if a key exists and this is done by using the h exists command. So we're going to say h exists so it's going to be h exists and in this case you have to specify that record of data or that key. So in this case it's going to be person 1 now let us say we want to check if the gender field exists. So we may do that by providing gender. And this is going to return zero, meaning this key does not exist. However, if this existed, it will return one. So for example, if we want to check for our age, so we may say person one, and then provide our age. This will return one, meaning that our person has the age field. So let us go ahead and also try out other things. So in case we want to return all the fields and their respective values, the way we're going to do that is by using the h get all command. So we may do something like h get, sorry for this. And this is actually going to basically return all the keys the key as well as all the fields and all the values that 
it has so in this case we say person one and this will go ahead and return the name the name that's jonathan the age that's 23 and the nationality that is uganda so this basically returns all the information about a specific hash now let us go ahead and also look at a very interesting thing now in this case we have a field that has a value of an integer so we can be able to also go ahead and try out some of the operations that we may do on an integer for example incrementing it by a certain amount so the way we're going to do that is by using the h increment by and this will take in the key and this will be our person one and then we shall provide the field so the field in this case is going to be our edge and then the increment let's say i want to increment this by one and now we shall see our age is going to be four so if we try to get it with h gate when you provide the key which is person one when we provide our field which is age our age will be updated to 24. so in case i wanted to set uh, a, a field and the value for something that has not existed we also have the h set x set nx command so that basically works by saying h set nx and this will return this will basically take in the key or the record of data that we are storing the key so let's say i want to check if to basically create an agent if it does not exist then let's say we set this to 45 that will fail because we already have our age set and that will be 24. now let us go ahead and try to get our age so we shall get that by h get person one and then when you provide our age to still return our age as 24. now since we have all our keys so if we say h keys and then we say person one and that will return our name our age and our nationality we can also go ahead and basically delete a certain key and its value or delete our field and a certain value so the way we do that is by saying h in this case we have the h del so this basically takes in the key and let's say i wanted to get rid of the field for the edge we'll do that by saying h and this will basically delete the edge field with its value and then if we try to get all the fields so when we say h keys and we provide the key which is person one in this case we are going to get our name our age and our so this is basically for person we we are supposed to delete it for person so let's try to repeat this so if i say h del and then provide our key as person one and the field as edge this will go ahead and delete our edge so if we try to get all keys or let's try to get h keys for our person one this will return only our name and our edge meaning our edge does not exist so if you try to say h get all and then provide our person one as the key we shall see that we have the name and the nationality meaning our age has been deleted so today we need to be looking at the set data structure that Redis provides i say it provides for us a way in which you can be able to store unique items and the order does not actually matter so let us begin by creating a simple list to demonstrate what we are actually talking about right here in my ready cli i'm going to begin by creating a simple set and i'll use the set add command so i'm just going to say s add so this takes in the set key now i'm going to create a simple list of programming languages and it's going to be langs so let me create it and call it actually langs one so this will take in our member so let our first member be a programming language such as python and let's say we are also going to add java we can add php we can add c sharp we can add maybe go and let's say that so once we do this i'll go ahead and add our items so this has gone ahead and created our simple set now one of the things that we can try to do is to add one of the items that are existing to prove that this actually stores unique items so i'm going to go ahead and use the s add command then specify the same set and i'll say langs one so let's say we try to add python 
Now this is going to fail because it's going to return an integer value of zero and it's going to fail because in a set you can't have two items that are having the same string value. So let us go ahead and try to retrieve all the members present in this set. The way we do that is by saying s members and then provide the set key. So in this case we shall have length one and this will go ahead and return all the items within our set. Now in case we want to verify if a certain item or a certain member exists within our set, we can use the s is member command. And what this does is to basically take in the key. So we can say langs one. Now we can check if Rust exists within our list of programming languages. And now it doesn't exist because we are returning zero. So let's say if we check for something that exists, so let's say we're going to check for our Python. In this case, it's going to return one, meaning that Python exists within this set. Now, apart from just adding, we can be able to also remove an item in case we want to get rid of it. So I'm going to do that by using the SRAM command and by specifying, we have to specify the name or the key of the set and in this case is slangs one then specify the member and in this case our member is going to be maybe c sharp so i'm going to remove c sharp and this will return one meaning that our c sharp has been removed so when you try to access all the members we're going to see that c sharp is no longer part of our set as it was at the beginning so apart from just adding and removing items from our list we can be able to carry out things such as uh, set operations now if you're familiar with sets from programming languages and maybe set theory in general we have some set operators such as union intersection and differences that we may operate on sets so we're going to be able to explore some of these in detail so to begin i'm going to begin by creating a simple I'm going to begin by creating a simple second set. Now I'm going to first clear our terminal right here and then I'll go ahead and use s add to create this set. So I'll call this lengths and then two and then I'll specify the members. So let's say we're going to have Java, we shall have PHP, actually called it HPHP. So this is going to be PHP and we shall have let's say Ruby and then let's say we shall have Kotlin. So let's also add another programming language, another programming language here. So let's say we're going to have JavaScript and let's say we shall also have uh, C++. So I've added uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and let's also add one common one that is going to be common to all. So which is going to be Python. And once we have this, I'll go ahead and press enter. So this list has seven items. Now, in case we want to carry out these operations, we shall begin with our S union. So I'm going to begin by demonstrating by using the S union command. So when you use the S union, we shall provide the keys and these are just the set keys. So in this case, let's say we want to find out items that are in all of the sets combined. Now we shall have blanks one and then have blanks two. And this will return all the items that are going to be within the lists. Now, if you are observant, you shall realize that all of the items that exist in both sets are actually referred to as one unique item, just like we see here. So we have items that are common to both lists, such as Java and Python, and those are all one. So let us go ahead and try to uh, find out items that exist between the two sets. So the way we're going to do that is by using the s inter command and this takes in the list keys, actually the set keys for the specific items that you want to check. So in this case, I'll go ahead and provide langs and in this case it will be langs 2 as well as langs 1. So when you go ahead and, and enter we're going to find out that the items that exist in between these two sets are Python, Java, and PHP. Now, in case we wanted to store this maybe in another set, we can use the s inter store 
command and this takes in a destination set in case it will go ahead and actually create a destination set where it shall keep the result of this command so let us go ahead and create that so i'll just call it langs 3 and this will take in the langs the sets and these are the sets that we actually created so we shall have langs 1 as well as langs 2 so when i press enter in this case we shall have the three items taken to langs 3 so if i find out the members in langs 3 this shall have java python and php meaning that we have all of them stored just there so let us try out some set differences so i'm going to begin by basically find out the items that exist in set one but do not exist in set two so i'm going to begin by doing that so we do that using by safe set diff and in this case we shall provide keys so in this case shall have langs one and then langs two so this is very similar to saying something like langs one minus langs two which will return only the items in langs one so when i press enter we shall find out that go and that are the only programming languages that exist between langs one but they don't exist in langs two and in case we wanted to store it we may also do something like s diff store and then you provide the destination array now I'll call this uh, a destination set which i'll call langs four and in this case shall go ahead and provide the results so let's say langs one and langs two now this will go ahead and provide this now in case we wanted to find it to find out langs four so in this case i'll say langs four that will go ahead and return go and that as the only items in langs four today we're going to be looking at the sorted set data structure that redis provides the sorted set is a data structure that allows us to store unique items but in an ordered way the order of these items is determined by the score that each of the members of the sorted set has. Each of the members of a sorted set also has a rank associated with it. So this rank is very similar to what we may look at as an index in a list. And let's go ahead and look at this illustration. So you have an illustration of a simple leaderboard. This is actually the most obvious example of a sorted set because it offers a natural way to order all the items based on their scores. Now we have all these members, which are seven members, and we have their scores, and we also have their ranks, which are basically the index, indexes or indices of all of the members of the sorted set. Now each of these members has a score, and the order is determined by the score, and by default we have an ascending order starting from the smallest to the biggest, and when you have items having the same score, their order will be determined by their alphabetical order. Now, that's why we have Julie and Leslie having the same score, but each of them has, uh, each, each is ordered by the later. So in this case, we have Julia coming first and Leslie coming second. We're going to be looking at some of the commands that Redis provides that can be able to help us understand such a leaderboard. Now, I'm going to go to our Redis CLI right here. Now, I'm going to begin by running flash all. This is the command that you use to clear all the variables you may have in memory. And after running that, we are going to go ahead and create our leaderboard. So the way you create a sorted set is by using the Z and command or Z add. Now, then we provide a key. So the key is basically the name of a specific sorted set that we want to create. And let's just call this our leader, leaderboard. And when you have this leaderboard, you can go ahead and provide scores. Now, I'm going to be using the example that we have right here. So we're going to begin by James, who has a score of 100, and his index will be 0. So I'm just going to come and say we're going to have uh, the score of 100, and then we provide the member. So this will be James. And once we provide that, we can see that our leaderboard is now having an item of one. We have been able to add one item to our sorted set. Now let us go ahead and add multiple items. So to do that, I'll say Z add, and then specify the leaderboard. And in this case, we shall have our 
scores so we're going to start with george who has a score of 120 so we shall say it's going to be george and then we shall go to jerry who has 150 so this will be jerry and then we shall go and say gloria who has 200 and this will be 200 and then gloria and then we shall also has brad which has a score of 245 so that will be Brad 245. We shall have 900 for Julia and 900 for Leslie. So once we have this, uh, we've been able to add all these to our sorted set. Now let us go ahead and retrieve all of them and see the order with which they will be organized. So to return all this, we can use the Z range command. And this takes in the case. So this is going to be our leaderboard and we shall have to provide a rank or an index from where i'm going to start and it's going to be zero now since we have seven items in our sorted set our last index is going to be six and this will be from zero to six and this is going to basically return all the items that we have within our sorted set now we want to return them with scores we shall just provide an extra argument which is going to be with scores and this will be showing us our sorted set but our sorted set is going to be returned with the respective scores now we see the score the order of the items is basically starting from james who has the lowest score of 100 going to leslie who has a score of 900. now another thing we can be able to see here is Leslie and Julia have the same scores, but Julia comes first and Leslie comes second because uh, of the alphabetical order by which these members are ordered. <coughs> now let us go ahead and try to see how we can do the reverse. Now if we want to maybe organize our sorted set in or retrieve items but in a descending order, we can use the Z range, but in this case, it's going to be a reverse, so you can say Z range. When you press enter, this is actually going to return our sorted set, but starting with the item that has the highest score going down to the item that has the lowest score. Now let us also look at how we can be able to retrieve the ranks of certain members. Now the way we do that is by saying Z, and in this case rank then we specify the key which is going to be the name of our sorted set so this is actually going to be the board and then we shall provide the member now let's say I wanted to retrieve the score of leslie so that will be the the rank it's actually going to be the rank and that rank is going to be six now keep in mind that the rank is basically an index now if we wanted to return maybe the one for james so shall provide James as the member and that will be zero because James is at the first position in our sorted set. Let us go ahead and look at how we can return the scores. So the scores are basically the ones that we are using to determine our order. Now to return the score, we are going to use this score and then provide the leaderboard and then provide, let's say, uh, the score for Leslie. And this is going to return 900. Now if we want to return the score for James, it's going to also return 100. And that is basically how we return the scores. Now let us say we wanted to increase the score of a certain member. Let's say they played the game and they won and their score within our leaderboard increased. Then we do that is by using the Z increase by command. So this takes in the key, which is the name of our sorted set. It takes in the increment or the number by which we're going to increase the score. So let's say 10. And then let's say we're increasing the, the score for the certain member. So let's say that member is James. Now their updated score will be 110. If we wanted to reduce the score of a certain member within our set, we're going to use the increase by and then specify the key. In this case, it will be our leaderboard. And we shall go ahead and provide a negative value. So let's say negative 19. And we're going to reduce uh, Julia's score. So let's say Julia 
and then their score will be 881. So when you try to return our leaderboard with scores, in this case, our scores are going to be updated and this will be 900 and 881 and then GMC's score will also be 110. Now let us go ahead and look at how we can return items that are having scores in a certain range. So if you want to maybe count the number of members within our sorted set that have a score that ranges from a certain range to a certain range, we can use the Z count command. So when you say Z count, in this case, it can be basically taking the key. So let's say leaderboard we can provide the main and the max. So basically these are the ranges. So we can say, we want to return each uh, member, the, the count of each member that has a range between 100 and let's say 500. And this will return five. Now let us try to observe here. If we're to basically check this out, we have uh, James, George, Jerry, Gloria, Brad, having scores that are ranging between 100 and 500. Now what if we wanted to return or we wanted to actually remove a certain member from our sorted set? The way we do that is by using the ZREM command. So when you say ZREM, you can provide the key which is going to be our leaderboard and then we provide the member. So let's say James and that is going to be one. So if we try to retrieve our range with scores, in this case, we see that James has been removed from our list. Now, these are the most common commands that may be associated with a sorted set. And I hope you found this video useful. So today we're going to be looking at the Publish Subscribe model and how we can be able to use it within Redis. So the Publish Subscribe model allows us to be able to asynchronously send messages between various clients. And the way it achieves this is by classifying those clients into publishers and subscribers. Now, to put it simply, we can be able to say that our publishers are those clients that send messages. Now, they do those activities through channels or through topics, but in this case, we're going to call them channels. And whatever client is able to receive that message is what we call a subscriber. Now, this is a very simple diagram to basically show how this may work in reality. So a client will publish a message to other clients that are subscribed to a particular channel. In this case, we have channel one and we have subscriber one and subscriber two only being subscribed to channel one. So when you send a message to channel one, what happens is only those two subscribers, subscriber one and subscriber two, will be able to get that particular message. Now for the second case, since subscriber two is subscribed to channel one and channel two, they'll be in position to receive the message that is sent by client one, which is our first publisher, and client two, which is our second publisher. Now to demonstrate this, I'm going to jump into our terminal. So to do that, I'm going to be going to my Terminator. So I have this tool called Terminator, which I'm going to be using as my Terminal Emulator. Reason being, it helps me to split my Terminal into various Terminal instances, which is a very cool feature. So to get started, I'm going to start by opening up our 3D CLI. Now this is going to be a client. When you open up this 3D CLI, the way we can be able to subscribe to a channel is by using the subscribe command. So to do that, I'll just come and say subscribe, and then I'll provide the channel name. So in this case, let us call this channel messages. So when you call this channel messages, I'm going to go ahead and basically press enter. And what will happen here is we are going to be reading all messages that will be sent to this particular channel. Now, this client in this case is what we're actually going to refer to as our subscriber. And it is currently subscribing to the channel called messages. This means that every message that we shall send to or publish to our messages channel will be received by that particular subscriber. So what happens is every time we subscribe to a channel, 
that specific client or terminal will be able to read messages sent to that particular channel. So let us go ahead and try to basically publish a message to this channel. So I'm going to use Ctrl Shift E. I'll leave a link down in the description to this terminal so that you can check it out. But the first thing I'll do is first enter our ready CLI so that we create another client. Now let us go ahead and publish our first message. So to publish a message, we use the publish command. And when you have the publish command, then you can go ahead and provide our channel name. And in this case, it's going to be messages. Then you provide the message that you actually want to send or publish to a certain channel. Now, in this case, let's just say hello world. This will go ahead and basically send this message to the client that is subscribed to the channel messages just like you see here i hope you can get an understanding of how this works we have a channel and we have a client that subscribe to that channel when you have a client subscribing to the channel they can be able to read all messages that are published to that specific channel that's how it works so let's go ahead and try to also implement another client that will be subscribed to the same channel. Now I'm going to go on the left side of my terminal. I'm going to create a new terminal instance right here. And I'll open up with this CLI. When I, when I do this, I'll enlarge this a little bit so that you can see. Now the first thing I'm going to do is to go ahead and listen to whatever messages that will be published on the messages channel. So I'll do that by using subscribe. And then we shall provide our messages channel. But let's make this interesting by subscribing to another channel. So let's go ahead and just do uh, notifications. So when you do that, I'm going to press enter. What is going to happen is this client is going to basically listen to the messages that will be sent on the messages channel as well as the notifications channel so if we go ahead and publish another message right here so let's publish this to our messages channel what happened is this message will be received by both of these clients because both of these clients are actually subscribed to the channel of messages so let me go ahead and also create one message that will be sent to all those clients that will be subscribed to the notifications channel now let me begin by creating another client here i'm going to press ctrl shift o to create this terminal here i'll enter already this cli and then i'll begin by basically subscribing to the notifications channel so i'm just going to come and say subscribe to notifications and when I press enter, this is going to be listening to only the notifications channel. Now, that can be a simple demonstration of what we have here. We can call this client 1, client 2. We can actually call this client 1, client 2. And this is going to be our only publisher. But when we publish a message, it will be actually got by whatever channel will be subscribed to by whatever client that will be subscribed to the specific channel. Now let us go ahead and try to send or publish a message to the notifications channel. So do that and say publish and then provide notifications, which is going to be our channel. So I'll provide a message and say uh, your the simple notification, your battery is low. When you press enter, we will see that this message will be received by our first client, which is the one that subscribed to both channels and the second client that's only subscribed to the notifications channel. Redis transactions allow you to execute multiple Redis commands in a certain order. So let's say you want to have many commands that you want to execute in a certain order. And let's say also you have a situation in which the failure of one command should lead to the failure of all other commands. The Redis transactions are the way you can be able to do something of that sort. So let us get started by creating a simple Redis transaction. A simple Redis transaction can be created. So I'm on Linux and this is Terminator and this is my Redis CLI. By using the multi command, 
once we provide multi then you have to provide the other commands that you want to execute now let's say we are setting the count and let's give it a value of 100 if you want to increase this so we can do something like increase so one thing you can notice is when you press enter this command is actually going to be queued meaning it will be waiting to get executed so let us go ahead and increase this uh, I'll increase count sorry for that so I'll increase count and then after increasing count I'll go ahead and also increase it by a certain value so I'll increase it and then I provide the count and then say 45 so after doing that then let's say we are decreasing this and you're decreasing our count so this will also be queued if you want all these commands to be executed then we'll go ahead and provide exec and you see that all these commands are going to be executed in the order by which we gave them so the first command you see that's executed is one for setting the count which returned okay the one for increasing the count the one for increasing the count by 45 and the one for basically decreasing this count by one so these are executed in the order that we gave all of them and are only executed after we call the exec command let us try to also go ahead and execute a command with an error so i'm going to go ahead and first discard everything so i'll do that by saying flash all however i can also do discard so i'm going to begin by creating a simple transaction let us just repeat what we are doing so i maybe set our count to 100 and let's say if we get to create an error so let's say increase count and then i provide the value which we shouldn't actually provide we're going to get an error now when you try to execute these commands no command is actually going to be executed and this shows us how redis transactions cannot allow for all transactions within a transaction queue to be executed if we have an error within our transactions now let us go ahead and discard all of them so to discard all commands in a command queue we do that by doing discard and that will go ahead and so basically we don't have error we don't have any so let's say we had multiple commands let's say set count and then we set it to 100 and then let's go ahead and increase this by a certain amount which is one when you go ahead and discard this is going to go and get rid of every transaction that we basically have in our transaction queue so if we do exec what will happen is all the transact all the commands have actually been removed and therefore we cannot execute any of the transactions so i hope you've got to learn a thing or two about transactions in redis 